Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to Celebrating Act 2, and John Coleman and I get to speak with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. How you doing, John? Very well, thank you. Hey, John, um, you recall not too long ago on your radio show, you invited me and a bunch of other of our high school classmates to talk about college bars that we knew. And um, we had we had a great time doing that, by the way. Uh, do, do you remember the barge? Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite bars, because it was right down the street from me. And the bartender there was a guy, a, an older guy named Cheech. I don't know what his real name was, but he called everybody Cheech. Hey, Cheech, how you doing? So he was Cheech to everybody. And he was, he was one of what we considered the greatest bartenders in the world. A, because he was friendly. He called everybody Cheech. Who knows? What, it could have been an insult. We didn't know. Yeah. And he would do buybacks, right? He would do like every third beer. You'd get a, he'd tap the bar and you'd get a free beer. But, you know, you, <laughs> I laugh thinking about that because you, when you review restaurants, you're really talking about the places that are worth uh, a lot of money, you know, worth spending a lot of money at mm. that are high end that are, um, you know, worthy of a review or not. And I've been with you a number of times at, at these restaurants and the bars and the bartenders there are of a different ilk. They are, it's like a, it's like, you know, it's just a whole different level of professionalism. But that's not true everywhere, is it? Bartenders. No, and, and you know, I, I I don't go to just fine dining uh, venues. I go to all sorts of them. I would go to a tiki bar. I would go to, <clears throat> or I might go to a really swank bar like the King Cole Bar in the in the St. Regis, which is famous for its mural and uh, for bringing the Bloody Mary to New York. So there, there's various reasons, but I'm not going to go to a shops and beer bar or a place run by my mom. Who is it? Who is it? Uh, Cramden, the bartender, Joe, the bartender, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, garters and so forth. And, uh, you know, shots and beer bar dive bars are places where mostly people go to drink beer or yes. shots. And uh, often if they put, put the shot into the, um, into the beer itself, it's called a depth charge. Right. Right. Um, and those bartenders can be wonderful guys as you in, indicated about Cheech, and you get to know them, and the buybacks were terrific. I don't even know that anybody does buybacks anymore. But what I found is that up in, in a level just up from that, because of those places, nobody really expects one of those bartenders to make great martini or great daiquiri or whatever, because uh, they're rarely called upon to do so, you know? Um, but at the, let's say if you go back 50, 60 years, let's say to our parents' time, your father and my father could walk into any good dining room in the world, whether it's in California or here in New York, any any nice restaurant, pleasant restaurant, and just say, yeah, I'd like a, uh, a Manhattan straight up uh, bourbon and knew exactly what they were going to get. These days, many bartenders have no clue how to make a Manhattan, have a clue, especially to make a daiquiri, which is why, as we've discussed on this show before, that I carry around a little card, my business card on the back says, how to make a daiquiri. Three ingredients, shake, put it to a martini glass, boom. They still screw it up because they're really not bartenders. They're just people there. You know, you know that terrible show where the guy goes into the bar and is completely dysfunctional and nobody seems to know it. And all of the uh, bartend dresses, or whatever you call them, have enormous boobs and, and, and decolletage and are cheating. So, I mean, that's all, that's not that's fantasy TV. But um, a good bartender can be one who at least has to know the classic cocktails. You got to know how to make a good Bloody Mary. You got to have the ingredients back there for a Bloody Mary, which include horseradish, Tabasco, celery salt, black pepper, a decent vodka, tomato juice, um, I may be leaving something out of there. Oh, the Worcestershire sauce, Worcestershire. I mean, that's what a Bloody Mary is. 
And if you don't have, a, have the time or uh, inclination to do it, you're going to make it in advance. They're going to get watered down, and it's not going to be what you really want to drink. Um, same with the daiquiri. They use a lemon juice out of a bottle. But last night, for instance, I went to an excellent, first-rate, excellent steakhouse here in New York, Benjamin's, and I didn't have my card with me. How did I get daiquiri? And I said, you know, even here, although they're sure they have a really good bartender, he's going to screw it up. So I said, I know he knows how to make a Manhattan. So he made me a perfect Manhattan. Uh, this shouldn't happen because it doesn't happen in, of all places, I found, good hotels. Good hotel bars, many are swankier than others. But the swankier ones, you know, we're, we're talking about $14, $15, $18, $20 $20 for a cocktail. It better be good. The, the, the glass should be chilled. You know, the ice cube should be the kind that don't melt. Uh, they should have a, 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 a muddler in order to, a wooden muddler to put on the, the orange juice, the, the orange uh, slices and the lime slices and muddle them in with the sugar or with the, uh, that, that, that's what creates a better cocktail than just pouring liquor into a glass. Um, and so for all these reasons, um, I think a lot of modern bartenders are failures. Um, they don't really care. They're not, they're mixologists. These guys, have no desire to learn how to make a classic drink. They want to make something that is infused with basil and agon oil, you know, and uh, has a chili pepper sticking sticking out of it. Uh, they still don't even know how to make a pina colada, these guys. Um, there are such things as bartender schools, but <laughs> how many people go to them and what do they, they learn? There are, every bartender I know has, uh, what is it, Mr. Mr. Somebody's uh, Cocktail bar book, red book, everybody knows it. Um, at least the, the liquor company used to give it out. Now does all the classic cocktails, that's all you're gonna need. But now they come out with these mixologists, 300, pound, 300 page books, 99% are cocktails that we'd never wanna drink more than once. And um, the first 30 pages of this newest one I got, beautiful book, 30 pages is devoted to how to stock your bar what a, an old-fashioned glass is. Um, if you need that kind of help, then you're not, you're not going to be a very good bartender to begin with. Um, and then now I'll tell you about some great... But any questions, class? Yeah, so, the, so just in general, unless you're going to a, a, a Michelin-starred restaurant, uh, where I assume you might have an even chance of getting a, a really good, knowledgeable bartender, uh, What's the chances of somebody running into in an in a otherwise good restaurant with good food, uh, a, a decent bartender? And he is that, or is it just haphazard? Well, it is to a certain extent haphazard, but uh, and the the odds do not favor you. But no. you don't, you know, Michelin saw a restaurant uh, is not the quotidian that it, it once was, in any case. But uh, one of the best cocktails I ever had was a daiquiri. I was in Big Sky, Montana in a really nice resort, rustic, the rivers flowing right outside, and they sort of elk, and you know, and moose tongue, and sort of food. And uh, there's this guy behind the bar, and uh, I said, boy, I'd really like a daiquiri, but this guy doesn't look like he's gonna be making, and my friend said, order one. I watched him make it, and he took fresh lime, cut him, squeezed the fresh lime juice in, put the shells of the lime, in there, put in some sugar or sugar syrup, put in the rum, muddled it. The, 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 the shaker itself was cold because he took another shaker out, <clears throat> put in the ice, shook it up, took out a frozen uh, a martini glass, poured in, came right to the brim, had this little frappe on it, and I tasted it and I said, this is perfection. So it can happen anywhere. And uh, I think the more serious uh, the owner of a hotel or a, or a resort takes, I mean, you know, certainly you can go to Aspen and places like that or, or the Hotel Bel Air, you're going to get um, a first rate bartenders. And those guys tend to stick around for a long, long time because bartenders are your friends. 
And um, there's nothing, nothing, uh, much more so even than knowing the maitre d' and saying, oh, hello, Pierre, I like my usual table, is, uh, again, my father could walk into a restaurant because he frequented it, frequented it, and he'd say to Francois, yeah, a table for four. He says, oh, miss, right this way, Dr. Mariani. Oh, we're, first, we're going to go to the bar. You go to the bar, and there's Tony. You know, Mr. Mariani, how are you? Your usual? And he'd give my father his usual and, and uh, my, my, my mother. Um, that's the best kind of bartender who really, really knows you. Now, I, I, I listed an article I wrote for Forbes, uh, those whom I have thought have been uh, just first rate. In, in every way, that guy in uh, Big Sky, uh, Wyoming, is because there's a guy named Colin Field. He's a Brit. He's been at the Hemingway Bar and the Paris Ritz Hotel for many, many years. And it, when he wanted to uh, close for COVID, they certainly brought Colin back. And he's written a very good uh, book called The Ritz Paris Mixing Drinks, A Simple Story. And it is not 200 pages, but it is very, very authoritative. And he and I have battled for years over the origins of the Bloody Mary, which uh, I insist uh, goes back to um, Harry's New York Bar, which is uh, the Rue de Nou, and he says, no, it was at the Hemingway Bar. We've been going back and forth after years. But he's a literate, a great rock on tour. And I quote him, and this is what he says about it. It's the last word on the subject since I've rambled on. He says, while cocktail bartenders of the past used to only speak when spoken to, today's bartender must be both the showman and the host. He must create the moment and keep the show running, just like the host at the Oscars. He must be generous with himself and his own life and offer a divertisement to his clients through his personal experiences stimulating conversation and interaction. They can thus voluntarily forget their own problems and jump inside a second life for the time they are with him. Couldn't have said it better myself. Hmm. So he's a true master bartender. Maestro, maestro. Now, I have a question, John. Um, do you suppose, because I love a good, uh, my wife loves a good martini, I love Manhattans, I haven't heard anybody order a sidecar or a dockery or and and literally dozens of years. Hmm. So here's my question is is it that these drinks are of the past and nobody is ordering them and that's why bartenders don't have to do learn how to do them properly? Um yes, that's true because, but hmm. the frozen dockery is still the banana daiquiri, the strawberry daiquiri, those are still very, very popular tiki bar drinks, you know. And for some reason, the sidecar has been making a, a return, some headway here in New York. I'm not sure why, but I'm seeing recipes in the New York Times and New York Magazine and who makes the best sidecar in New York. So who knows, that, that, might, be, uh, that might be coming back also. Uh, but that there, there are, you know, the, what... To a certain extent, ruined um, cocktail making was vodka, which is a colorless, odorless, tasteless spirit by definition. Uh, that's what it's supposed to be. So when you buy one vodka over another, the superior quality of the one because it was filtered, I kid you not, filtered through diamonds or filtered through um, the czar's uh, charcoal. Um, and this stuff is petty nonsense. Um, but because vodka became so popular, first with the vodka martini and the Bloody Mary in the 1950s, and then because it was the it was the booze that you could drink and not smell on your breath when you got back to the office, um, that ruined a lot of good drinks for a lot of people. Mm. Well, today, of course, uh, you can go to any restaurant uh, randomly, and you will find that they're having uh, Captain Morgan Day. Right? Oh. And it's it's the 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 company that makes Captain Morgan. I, I just use them as an excuse because that's the last one I heard about. Uh, sends out three pretty girls uh, to the bar, and they're there all day, and they give you whatever the Captain Morgan drink of the day is at fifty percent off. They're, this is marketing. They're they're spending money to push 
new drinks that nobody's ever heard of, and quite frankly, liquor that could be questionable. Well, I don't know if Absolute still does it. Absolute mm -hmm. just went through the ceiling because they used to take full page ads that was done by Andy Warhol and uh, Rivers and, and other major artists that somehow affixed mm -hmm. the absolute bottle into the ad and didn't have to say anything. All it said was absolute on the label. That right. become very, I mean, these things are very hip, very trendy when, with regards to um, cult rums, like the 20 year old Mictus rum is now selling online, if you can find it, for $7,000. Yeah. Um, Pappy bourbon is can go for several thousand dollars. Um, it's just faddish. It's not that these things are so rare or that they didn't produce many bottles. It's just that a lot of people made them that way. Which is why in all the James Bond movies, Bollinger and Dom Perignon and the others and um, uh, Stolichnaya uh, paid the producers to sure. put right. on drinking their booze and their champagne. Yeah. Well, as long as they can still make a good Shirley Temple, then a good drink. Absolutely. You know, Maris, yeah. Maris, you don't hear much anymore. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. And uh, I guess, um, you know, we all have, uh, uh, whether it be uh, Archie's place, uh, when uh, Bunker had a place or uh, Cheers, uh, mm -hmm. they have sort of, been, those are probably few and far between. But I remember uh, growing up, um, and I didn't go to the bars that often, but I remember there was a uh, a, a bar down the street when I was going to college, uh, and back in the day, I think we could still drink at eighteen. Uh, and you go in for beer, and you play horse collar, and you'd always have a friendly. Uh, uh, in those days, only guys behind the bar who recognize you by your name, and say, "Hey, Art, how you doing? How's, how's the day going?" And so there's something to be said for that. But if you want a really good drink, that probably. Uh, uh, if you want a really good mixed drink, it was probably not the place to go. But it was a place that was warm and friendly. So um, uh, thank you for this trip down uh, and not oft discussed uh, uh, food and gourmet concept of what a bartender can do to make or break a, a meal or a place. Yep. I'll drink to that. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.